processing. Are you guys done the readings? The first time? Yes? Some of you. Well, this lecture is important because we'll cover uh, some of the things that you will do in the labs. Uh, this is one of the coherence protocols that is most commonly implemented in base processors, and hopefully you will do that in your lab. Messy cache coherence protocol. But we have other things to cover until we get to it. Final exam, you remember this. We'll talk about this later. Readings for today. I did add the Lamport reading to your readings. It's only two more pages. And it's such a seminal paper that uh, I think uh, in this course, if you read that, you'll enjoy it. it. Basically talks about sequential consistency that we will talk about. How should the operations, uh, load store operations coming from different processors be ordered such that you get a correct execution at the end? So hopefully you'll enjoy that. It's just a two-page paper. And if you're so inclined, uh, this is the paper that actually introduced the MESI protocol. Uh, you, can, you can read that as well. So last lecture, we wrapped up Red Hat Execution and started multi-processing. Uh, hopefully you remember everything we covered. MDAL's law, sequential bottleneck. We'll start with, pick up with sequential bottleneck today. And We'll finish up bottlenecks in parallel processing, and then talk about two major problems in multiprocessing. One is memory ordering problem, uh, and we'll look at one solution to it. And the other problem is the cache coherence problem, where you incorporate caches into uh, your system with multiple processors. How do you handle coherence or consistency of data uh, in a sing uh, for a single location? So the major difference between these two problems is the memory ordering problem is the uh, specifies the order of operations to all memory locations in a multiple processing. Whereas the cache coherence looks at a single memory location and tries to ensure that that location stays consistent. So they're both really about memory ordering, if you will, but the first one looks at all of the locations in memory. How should they be ordered with respect to each other? And the second one is a single location. How should the processor see the updates to that location? And we, you, this will become more clear when we get to it. And this is kind of obvious, if you will, right? Uh, if a processor writes to a location, hopefully another processor sees that right. There's some, there has to be some sort of dependency. You don't want to read the stale value. But this may not be obvious uh, to many of you. It's, it's, a, it's a more subtle problem than the cache coherence problem, I would say. OK, so let's briefly look at what we covered. We talked about loosely versus tightly coupled distinction of multiprocessors. Loosely coupled multiprocessors, these are essentially network-based processors, usually programmed with message passing. Tightly coupled, which we will focus on, have shared global memory address space across different processors. When a processor reference address A, all processors have that address A in their memory address space. And uh, the biggest difference between the two is operations on shared data require synchronization in the tightly coupled multiprocessors. Well, here, because you explicitly synchronize the processes, you don't need to uh, do synchronization on global memory locations, if you will. OK. So these are some of the main issues that we discussed. We're not going to be able to discuss all of them, but we will talk about uh, two things. Ordering of memory operations, what should the program expect the hardware to provide, and cache consistency, or cache coherence. And maybe next week we'll cover a couple more of these, uh, although it will have to be brief. But all of these issues are covered in 742. Okay, remember Amdahl's law? Uh, just to refresh your memory, maximum speed up uh, is limited by serial portion uh, based on Amdahl's law. I mean, you derived this uh, in the last lecture, so I'm not going to go over that. Basically, your speed up is 1 divided by the serial, uh, non parallelizable portion of your program plus parallelizable fraction divided by number of processors. Uh, so, as n goes to infinity, 
your speed up goes to 1 divided by 1 minus uh, parallelizable fraction, which means serial fraction. That means that you have a serial model. Your maximum speed up is limited by its serial portion. Even if 1% of your execution time is serial, cannot be parallelized, you'll get a maximum of 100 speed up, regardless of however many processors you put in. That means that uh, you better try to reduce that serial volume somehow. Okay. And this was also an abstraction. Right? You, don't, you cannot perfectly parallelize the parallel portion. And you know three, there are three fundamental reasons for this. Synchronization overhead updates to shared data. You need to serialize when you're updating shared data. And a lot of the things we will talk about today uh, will uh, we'll understand how that shared data updates happen. Like what, what goes on underneath in hardware to make sure that shared data update happens. Load and bounce overhead, remember this. Uh, one thread executes for one second, the other thread executes for 10 seconds. And if that's the case, you're really not perfect at parallelizing your parallel portion. Okay. And resource sharing overhead. If you have contention in the memory controller, you're not really, again, perfect at parallelizing the parallel parts because they're serializing when they access memory. Okay, so if you really want to improve performance, you would like to improve both of these, and parallel portion is also important. Just to give you an example of how important sequential bottleneck is, you can do this study on your own. Uh, this is a parallel fraction. I vary f here on the x-axis, and y-axis is the speed of this curve, and this is n. n is the number of processors. And the assumption is that this abstraction holds. So let's look at the screen curve. Screen curve is where n is 10. So obviously, if your parallel fraction is 1, you get 10x speed up, right? Uh, and the, the benefits of parallel processing happens when you really have high, a high parallel fraction. For example, here, it becomes more clear when n is 1,000. Well, I didn't take this up to 1,000, but up to, I took it up to 200. When it is 1,000, you get 10x speed up only when your parallelizable portion is like 90%. So you better have a regularly parallel program. Otherwise, you're putting 1,000 processors, and you're getting speed ups that are less than 10. So this shows the importance of uh, that, parallel, uh, that parallel or serial fraction. So if you really want to get the capabilities of multiprocessing, you'd better parallelize your program well. Basically, don't be bottlenecked by the sequential portion. Uh, and parallel machines have the sequential bottleneck. Why, why does this happen? Because of non-parallelizable operations on data. If you have non-parallelizable loops, for example, and this loop is non-parallelizable, right? Because the previous iteration depends on, uh, next iteration depends on the previous iteration. Uh, or there are cases where a single thread prepares data and spawns parallel tasks. If that takes 1% of your execution time, again, your speed up is limited to 100. So this is the picture I've, I've drawn in many previous lectures. I just want to show it to you here. And this part limits your performance. This is, a, this is just an example of a sequential model, if you can look at it. Uh, this is essentially a program that uh, generate tasks, and this is the task queue. You have a priority queue of tasks, and this part is sequential. And printing the solution, if you will, is sequential. You don't need to know what happens here. Uh, and this is the parallel part. Basically, in the parallel part, what happens is each thread uh, checks if the problem is solved, if that's the end of the program. If not, it gets a parallel part of the program from this priority queue, if you will, and tries to solve that subproblem. Uh, here, this is the real parallel part. This is the part where you actually get the task from a shared queue. So all processors share it, all threads, if you will, share a queue, uh, task queue, where they take tasks from. And tasks could be, let's say, let's go back to the histogram example we talked about previously, right? A processor can take, for example, five pages from a book. That could be a task to draw a histogram for. And when it's done, it takes five more pages. When it's done, it takes five more pages. That's, that's a program that's divided into tasks, and you, you have task-based parallel. 
But even, even in such a program, not everything is perfectly parallel, right? You need to spawn the threads, that's the serial part. You need to collect the solution, print the solution, another serial part. Uh, and then there, there are critical sections that are not perfectly parallel. The perfectly parallel portion is hopefully this part, but then you have resource contention and potential load imbalance issues over there as well. Okay. Bottlenecks in parallel portion, we already talked about this, this is just to give you a slide for it, if you will. Synchronization happens because of locks, mutual exclusion, and barrier synchronization, and we covered all of these in different ways. Uh, this is also communication, right? When you're synchronizing, you're really communicating values in memory locations. So you can view memory as a communication substrate. Right? That's, that's what's really happening. Your memory locations are actually places that provide uh, houses, if you will, for these values that are to be communicated between different processes, processors. Registers are like that too. We discussed this earlier, right? That's why data flow machines are actually uh, send data between uh, uh, instructions. You're really communicating data values. Okay, so synchronization causes thread serialization when shared data is contended. Load imbalance, parallel tasks may have different lengths. This could be due to many different things, imperfect parallelization as we discussed. It could be also due to microarchitectural effects, right? For some reason, one thread gets delayed uh, in the memory controller for a long time, much more than others, right, because of its behavior. As a result, you can get load imbalance. And this is the release speed of in parallel portion. And resource contention, again, uh, we've already talked about this. One solution to resource contention is replicate all the resources. That way you don't have any contention between processors, but this is a, a very expensive solution. That's why, that's why this is a real issue. Especially when you're putting multiple processors on the same chip, how do you replicate the memory channels, right? Because you're pin, pin limited. You don't have enough pins to do that. Okay. So resource contention adds additional latency that's not present when each task runs alone. Okay. So the difficulty uh, in parallel programming uh, is in two things, really. Optimizing performance in the presence of all of these bottlenecks parallel portion and the sequential bottleneck that we discussed previously. Let me go back to it quickly. This one. And there's another difficulty which is getting parallel programs to work correctly. And we will talk about some of this uh, today. So there are two major issues. When most, most of parallel computer architecture is really about designing machines that overcome these bottlenecks, sequential and parallel to get higher performance and higher efficiency, and also making programmers' job easier in writing correct parallel programs. But you don't want only correct parallel programs, but you also want high-performance parallel programs, and that makes life very tough for, uh, as a parallel programmer. Uh, now, for some uh, applications, there is a little difficulty, especially if parallelism is natural, like, like uh, graphics, for example. You have millions of pixels, and parallelism is very natural there, um, unless you somehow need to synchronize sometimes between those things. Uh, in that case, sequential bottleneck is smaller. And programming may be easier also. In fact, it is easier comparatively uh, compared to more irregular applications. Okay. Any questions? Well, just to go into the bottlenecks that we discussed. Uh, with, uh, with respect to Amdahl's law. So if you're interested in a lot of these topics, these topics are actually covered in more detail in parallel computer architecture, which is 742. And both are equally important, correctness and performance. With, and you will see this when we talk about memory, uh, memory ordering. Correctness was not as big of an issue in a single threaded program, right? As long as you obey the sequential execution model, people are uh, good at writing <laughs> sequential programs, if you want. But with a parallel program, let's see what kind of issues may arise. And that brings us to memory ordering. So ordering of operations. Uh, I, I've given you a, four operations here, A, B, C, D. The key question is, in what order should the hardware execute and report the results of these operations? Well, uh, this is 
a contract between the programmer and the microarchitect. Again, this is specified by the ISA, right? We've seen this. Uh, we've seen this in the von Neumann model. Von Neumann model says, well, the programmer specifies an order and the microarchitecture obeys it. Multiple data. Here, the difference between data flow is 
In a sense, this is more controlled, right? You have multiple sequential processors executing different instruction streams. Uh, each, we're we're going to assume that each processor obeys the von Neumann model. And each processor's memory operations are in sequential order with respect to the thread running on that processor. Uh, but multiple processors execute memory operations concurrently. Now, how does the memory see the order of operations from all processors? Or put another way, what is the ordering of all operations with the, from the perspective of each processor? Well, at least I already said that, huh? So why does it even matter, you could ask. Maybe I'm being too theoretical. We'll get down to an example. You guys know why, why it could matter? It's the same thing with data flow, right? Ease of debugging, again. Again, it's nice to have the same execution, but at uh, different times, have the same order of execution so that you can debug easily. If a, uh, if a memory location got updated by processor 0 before a memory location got updated by processor 1, different memory locations, in round 0, you'd like that to happen in the same order in round 1. Because if it happened in some other order, then your state is different, right? That's, that's something that has changed. Yes? Yeah, it actually might be nice if it doesn't run the same order. Because sometimes like, you just get nice orderings and then you don't find a bug in your program. And then you run it on another processor and it has the opposite order. And then all of a sudden there's this bug and you don't know why. Well, if, if, let's say if all processors obey the same order, that's another issue, I would say. Let's say all processors obey the same order in execute. Now you will never have a bug. Or you'll always have the same bug in all processors. So that kind of determinism also helps, but that's a, that's a separate issue. Okay, uh, it matters even in terms of correctness, and I'll pose you this question, if you read the two-page paper, you will know, know the answer. Can we have incorrect execution if the order of memory operations is different from the point of view of different processors? So a processor sees uh, A, B, C, D, another processor sees uh, let's say C, D, A, D. Does that affect things? And I'll give you an example showing that it does affect things. And you'll get incorrect execution because of that. And performance and overhead, we've already uh, discussed this. If you enforce a strict sequential ordering, this can make life harder for the hardware designer, uh, especially when you're implementing performance enhancement techniques. And we'll take a look at that as well. So let's, let's look at this. In fact, I'm going to give up this, because, uh, give this up, because this is going to be very hard to. Uh, provide. In fact, uh, the processors that I know do not provide this. When you run, uh, you could you could design software that provides us at very high overheads. Uh, but uh, when you run a multi-threaded application multiple times uh, on the same processor, you can get different answers. And exactly what that because of the ordering you can actually find uh, the box will be different also the box can come. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Why why could this affect correctness? Well, it affects correctness because of uh, updates of shared data structures. Problems happen when you have synchronization. I'll replicate this here so that I can run through this. Uh, oh. And you can probably see there are two processors and a very basic critical section algorithm. They're, they're, they're executing the same critical section and we want to protect uh, the entry of those processors to the critical section at the same time. Basically, if you look at that program, I don't tell you what happens in the critical section, but the key is only one processor should be in this critical section because presumably there is some shared data update that's happening in this critical section and you don't want another processor to read that shared data update to get an inconsistent semantic result in the program. So let's try to actually let me do this. So how do you how can you do this? Well this is a simple uh, way of implementing a critical section, right? The processor, the first processor sets F1 to 1, saying that uh, 
you can think of this as a condition variable or a synchronization variable, saying that it's going to enter the critical section. The other processor sets F2 to 1, saying that it's going to enter the critical section. Now, before entering the critical section, this processor, processor 1, checks F2. If F2 is equal to 0, then it can execute the critical section, right? Because this other processor has not entered the critical section yet. And at the end of the critical section, uh, the processor, either here, let's, uh, let's say it sets uh, F1 to 0 over here, so that it's exiting the critical section, basically. And else, I'm not going to show this code, but the processor needs to do something so that it re-enters the critical section somehow. Right? At this point, it's checking uh, whether it can enter the critical section, whether this processor is in the critical section. If F2 is 1, then it's in the critical section, though this should not enter, which means that it goes to this ELF block, and this ELF block contains some go-to, if you will. It's, uh, there, are, there are other ways of synchronizing, but you can ignore this one for now, for, the, uh, ex uh, for this uh, example's purpose. So the other processor does the same thing, right? It can enter the critical section if the other processor is not in the critical section, and it executes critical section code, sets F2 equal to 0 at the end, and then if it cannot enter the critical section, then it needs to retry. Actually, I'll call it retry. Okay. Okay. So the question is, can the two processors be in the critical section at the same time when they both obey the one Neumann model? Yes? Yeah, there can be deadlock. Ignore, ignore this for now. <laughs> okay, so I don't want to go into all of the, the different synchronization issues, but the, there can be deadlock, yes. Okay. Okay, so can the, can the two processors be in the critical section if they both obey the one by one model? Any, any ideas? The answer is yes, right? <laughs> As you expected. So uh, let's take a look at how, uh, how this could happen. So let's say you have processor 1, processor 2, and some network, if you will. And these are the memory locations F1 and F2. Uh, actually, I will probably go through this here. Uh, let's say P1 executes A. Well, I have to label this ABC so that you understand that without uh, going between the steps. This is A, this is F1 equals 1, this is B, this is a test, uh, and this is C, although we will not be concerned with C as much. This is X, let's say, F2 equals 1, this is Y, and this is Z. Let's say at time 0, processor 1 executes A, which means that it sets F1 to 1. Right? This is the score to F1. At that point, the processor 1 can say F1 is complete from that processor's view. Right? And A is sent to memory. Remember, A is updating F1. Let's see if we can do this in a different way. Oh, this doesn't move. That's not good. <laughs> Should have ordered these operations better, huh? Okay. So at this point, A is sent to memory. So at time 0, processor 1, if you will, completes A. At the same time, processor 2 executes this X. It sets F2 to 1. X is sent to memory. And from processor 2's point of view, that is complete right now. Right? Cluster 2 basically executed x over here. Now let's see what happens later. Uh, I replicated this here over here. At time 1, let's say cluster 1 executes b. It's going to test f2 and check if f2 is equal to 0. Right? 
So it loads F2, and this operation is sent to memory. And processor 2 executes Y, which is checking of F1. And Y is sent to memory. Let's say uh, 50 cycles later, you go through the interconnection network. Both of them go through the interconnection network and access these memory modules. And memory responds to both of them. Memory sends back to processor 1, F2, which is 0. And memory sends back to processor 2, F1, which is 0. There is 0 because the updates are not uh, gone, gone to memory yet. Why? Why could this happen? Because this could be closer, right? F2 could be closer to processor 1. There could be contention in the interconnection network. Does that make sense? Now both processors, uh, uh, processor 1 got F2 as 0, and processor 2 got F1 as 0. Let's say in, in time 51, now both processors check F2 and F1, respectively. And they both figure out that they're, all, they're both zero, and they both enter the critical section. Does that make sense? And at time 100, memory somehow receives uh, A at this point. Why? Because something happened in hardware, and uh, the messages got reordered and got delayed. And at that point, the processor, uh, the memory sets F1 to 1, uh, and F2 to 1 also. Happens. It doesn't have to be time 100, but basically the update of A has been received too late by memory. Does that make sense? Okay. So why did this happen? It happened because, uh, well, what is the problem? The problem is processor 1's view of memory operations and processor 2's view of memory operations is not consistent, if you will. I replicated here. Processor 1 observed the order of memory operations as A happened before B happened before X. Right. Because X got updated over here. Didn't explicitly observe it, but did observe it that way. Processor 2, on the other hand, saw X happening before Y happening before A. Make sense? Basically, F1, uh, it set F1 to 1, it tested F2, found out that it's 0, and uh, F2 was set to 1 at this point, in terms of processor 1's point of view. Whereas processor 2's point of view, F2 was set to 1 much earlier, right? because it could do the store right away to that location. Now the problem is, B is executed before X, remember B is the testing condition, and X is the setting condition, B is executed before X, at the same time Y is executed before A. And that led to both processors getting into the critical section. And the, the issue is the, pro the two processors did not see the same order of operations in memory even though they executed uh, programs, uh, their programs in sequential order, right? They had uh, A, B, that's sequential, X, Y, that's also sequential. Which means that we probably need some other ordering requirement to get this, at least get this program correct in a multiprocess. And that's the idea of sequential consistency. The idea is simple. All processors see the same order of operations to memory. That order can be an arbitrary order. As long as they see that same arbitrary order, you're guaranteed to have this program execute correctly. Well, arbitrary, except all memory operations happen, uh, well, except each processor executes its own operations in the sequential order. Yes? This is only for memory operations, yes. Because the process, different processors see only the memory operations of other processors. They don't see the add of another processor. As long as the memory operations are in the same order, 
And as long as sequential execution is maintained, all of the processors execute correctly. Sequential execution within a processor is maintained. So this means that all memory operations happen in an order that is consistent across all processors. And this is a global total order, if you want. And that's the idea of sequential consistency. Yes? How do you determine or the order to um, use memory uh -huh. for market for processor? They're both accessing it at the same time. Yeah. You just enforce an order, basically. So you just prioritize one. Process. That's right. You could do that. OK? So the definition is, uh, you, can, you can read the paper. Actually, you should read the paper. But a multiprocessor system is sequentially consistent if the result of any execution is the same, same as, uh, same as if the operations of all the processors were executed in some sequential order, and the operations of each individual processor appear in the sequence of the order specified by its program. So this is one minimum model, and this is the sequential order global order across all processors, if you will. Okay. So this is a memory ordering model, if you will, or memory model. And this is also specified by the ISA. The ISA specifies what happens when you have multiple processors executing the same ISA. In a sense, this is a programmer's abstraction, right? You can think of the sequential consistency as memory acting like a switch. At any given time, uh, it's servicing only one load or store from a processor. And all processors see the currently serviced load or store at the same time. And also each processor's operations are serviced in program order. You can think of it that way, right? Processor 1, processor 2, and you have this memory. And there's some connection. Uh, you eliminate the interconnection network somehow. And at, at any point, there is a switch. At any point in time, only one processor is connected to memory, if you want. Does that make sense? Okay. Which means that there, there, there are many potentially correct low orders. In, in this previous example, you can have, I think, one, two, three, four, five, six orders. There could be more. To I may have missed something. <laughs> so these are all correct orders, right? A, B, X, Y. A, X, B, Y. A, X, Y, B. X, A, B, Y. X, A, Y, B. And X, Y, A, B. Yes? Doesn't this restrict memory level parallel? Well, that's an excellent question, yes. <laughs> so how can you still get memory level parallelism while doing this? Remember, this is an abstraction. You can, underneath, you can reorder everything. It's like auto order execution. I'm not going to this in a lot more detail. Underneath, you can do auto order. As long as you maintain this abstraction for the programmer, you can get performance. It turns out this is a little bit harder abstraction to maintain, though. Auto order execution is a little bit easier compared to this. But here, there are many processors involved, right? So how do you maintain this abstraction? Well, I'll let you think about that a little bit. I won't. I will not go into a lot more detail, uh, detail on this because it's an advanced topic. Okay. So all of these are actually correct orders from the pro programmer's point of view. Okay. So what does this mean? This means that within the same execution, all processors see the same global order, which means that there is no correctness issue anymore. But the other issue still remains. Across executions now, you can still have different global orders, right? Memory, for some reason, has this, uh, provides this order in one execution and provides this other order in another execution. And the, uh, in one execution, this processor enters the critical section first, this processor next. In another execution, it happens the other way around. Which means that debugging is still hard. It's actually very hard to satisfy this requirement, as I told you before. Okay. So this is a nice abstraction for programming, for correctness. But there are two issues with it, one of which you pointed out. Uh, well, actually, there are two issues. With, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the one you pointed out. It limits the aggressiveness of performance enhancement techniques. You have to. You can exploit memory localism. You can do out-of-order completion of memory operations. But you have to ensure that the sequential consistency 
is what's exposed to the program. The second is, actually, I'll pose this as a question. Is this really necessary? In other words, is it, uh, what I described to you, the sequential consistency, the definition, a single global order, if you will, across all operations that is observed by all processors for all memory operations, is that really necessary? Or is that too strong for correctness? It is really too strong. So many, that's, this is exactly the reason why many processors today don't implement sequential consistency. Because you don't really need to have every single operation uh, to be part of a total global order. How about a global order only across stores? Is that enough? I'll let you. Uh, there are some processors that implement the total store order memory model. It's a little bit more advanced than just a global order across all stores. Uh, but stores are what really matter. That's right, x86 actually has this uh, model. I won't go into too much more detail. You can take uh, 742. Or, if you think about it, this matters only at the boundaries of synchronization, right? When you're not synchronizing between processors, you don't really care about the relative order of their operations. Does that make sense? If the, let's say a, a prime example of this is you're executing independent programs on two processors. They never touch each other's data. You don't care about the global order across those operations, right? So that's why this requirement is very strong. You really care about ordering when there's synchronization that happens between data. And people have developed relaxed memory models, if you will, that preserve order across critical sections or across synchronization events, if you will. Across, uh, let's say you have lock acquired, lock release operations, those have to be ordered with respect to each other, but not any arbitrary data access. So most processors implement uh, memory models like this that do not have too strong, as strong requirements as sequential consistency. In fact, it turns out these help performance also, because across those Operations that do not require ordering, the memory system can service them in any order, and you don't need to preserve an abstraction for the program. Okay. Okay. The other issue is the performance enhancement techniques, uh, and these could make sequential consistency implementation difficult. This is another reason why sequential consistency is not directly implemented today. Like out of order execution, right? You have loads that have an auto order with respect to each other and with respect to independent stores. Why is this an issue? This is an issue because in an auto order processor, you load a value early in the pipeline, right? And you don't necessarily need to check that. Check whether you loaded the correct value. As long as it's the correct value within your own program, you get the right answer. But now some other processor may have written to that location while that load is uh, after that load loaded the value but before it retired does that make sense? so you may, you may have actually loaded an incorrect value from the perspective of memory order I'll let you think about it uh, similarly caching a memory location is present in multiple places uh, and if you cache that location and if you do a store to that location, now that store is not seen by other processors, right? And if you want to expose all of the stores to other processors, then you essentially have a write through cache. So you don't get the benefits of write back cache. Okay. Does this make sense? Is it interesting? Yes? How, um, I don't really know the metrics, but how long does it take to um, send data in across L1 caches so that you synchronize L1 caches? And then you can actually use right that. So that, is that. Does that work in one cycle? Or? Oh, I see. Well, we'll talk about cache coherence. 
Cache coherence actually helps implementation of sequential consistency. You basically keep each location coherent. Yes? Yeah, not enforcing that easy to debug thing. Mm -hmm. Then why aren't you just doing the backup? I, I don't so understand that. Like, like the reason you weren't doing data first because it was hard to debug, right? But we're not enforcing that in this one anyway. Well, there are many other reasons also, right? Here, uh, the programming model is still sequential yeah. within each thread. So you still have precise exceptions. That's right. You still have precise exceptions within each thread, right? Actually, you can have precise exceptions across the entire system. OK. But data flow has other issues as well that we discussed. OK. Let's move on to the other topic, cache coherence, which again affects the correctness of a multiprocessor. Uh, well, we've been talking about the shared memory model. It means that maybe you have many parallel programs communicating through the shared memory. And this is one example of communication between different processors, if you will. Each read that happens should receive the value, last value written by any other processor. Right? So this requires synchronization. That's the reason for synchronization between processors. That's the reason you have these false terms. But what if this memory location was cached in, in the processor, in one of the processors? How does this other processor get that value? That's the basic problem in cache coherence. Basically, if multiple processors cache the same block, how do they ensure that they all see a consistent state for that particular block? Now, let's give, uh, let me give you an example here. It's very simple. This is block X. Let's say word X, if you will. It has the value of 1,000 in memory. Processor 2 loads that value. Now, that value is in its cache. The processor, processor 1 also holds that value. Now the value is in that cache. Let's say processor 1 adds to that value, makes it 2,000, uh, well, adds to it, and then stores it. And when it stores it, if this is a write back cache, this is still 2,000, memory is 1,000, and this cache now has stale value. So when this cache, this processor loads from location x, it really should not get x. It should not get 1,000. Right? If somebody else, in the meantime, updated that location. But why is this important? Well, it happens here, right? F1, F1. If this processor cached F1 and updated it to be 1, okay. oh, I don't know what's happening there. Wow, that was fast. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> Am I going the right way? Oh, there it is. OK. Yeah. If this processor cached F1, and if this processor didn't see the update of F1 to become 1, then again, we have incorrect execution. Okay. Well, that's why we want caches to be coherent. We want this cache to actually load 2,000. OK. Any questions so far? Have you guys seen cache coherence before? No? So 2.13 doesn't go into this? Doesn't depend on. Okay. It's an interesting topic for sure. So whose responsibility is this? That's the first question, right? You have caching in hardware. Who should be responsible for ensuring that this processor loads 2,000? Well, you we could say, uh, let the programmer deal with this. Can the programmer ensure coherence if caches are invisible to software? Well, that is certainly not possible, probably, right? Uh, although you could potentially do things. Uh, you could potentially have page-based coherence, right? Whenever you write to a page, you need to ensure that no other processor is actually, you can, you can lock that page. But then you need to ensure that locks are not cached. <laughs> so it, it becomes difficult, basically, right? become very difficult. What if I say provided a cache flush instruction? Now that could become easier, maybe. Let's say, let's say this is the broadest instruction. You have flush cache x. Flushes or you know these all blocks in cache x. Can you use that to actually provide coherence? You could, right? But then it's terrible for performance, probably. 
whenever you write to a block and whenever you expect someone else to read it, perhaps you flush the cache. I see. So for the first part, you're saying if yeah. the casts are invisible. But you still need to know the associativity in that case, right? Yeah. yeah, you still need something. So it's very tough here. If you, if you have some of these operations, some, some of these are harder. Uh, for example, if you have flush local A, flush is invalidates the cache block containing address A from a cluster's local cache. When do you use it? Well, you cannot really use it to provide coherence, I would argue. But I'll let you think about it. If you have flush cache instruction, you could provide coherence. Uh, at the programmer level, but it's very costly, right? Flushing your entire cache uh, when you actually need to, uh, just for correctness purposes. Well, correctness is good, of course, but maybe there's a better way of providing it. Yes? Also, that particular thread doesn't know about if the other thread needs it or not. That's right. It could be doing base for local. Exactly. You could be flushing your caches for no reason. I mean, another, another potential possibility is to uh, do this, right? Flush global A. When this processor is going to access, uh, is it going to do its load, it can first execute an instruction saying flush global. Flush global x. Flush x from everybody else's cache and get the right value. That way you can make it coherent, right? But this is again more burden on the programmer. Programmer needs to uh, insert these instructions before shared data loads. I'm not sure if this is even correct all the time. And hardware needs to provide that abstraction also. Meaning hardware already needs to have a mechanism to flush a location, a particular location from different clusters caches. Well, if hardware already has that mechanism, why doesn't it do, why doesn't it do the job for the programmer to begin with? Right? And that's the idea of the hardware cache for hands. Basically, it's the hardware's job to, uh, to maintain consistency of values, uh, consistent, uh, consistency of the value of a memory location across different caches. That's the idea of hardware cache coherence. And one simple idea is when a processor writes to a cache block, invalidate all other copies of that block from other caches. This way you can maintain correctness, right? Whenever you're doing it right, all other copies are flushed from different caches. So no, only one processor, only one cache has the modified copy. Yes? I mentioned this, I'm not sure, but for flush global, what happens if two different blocks have changes to it that are different from the current one? Yes, so that's a, that's a good question. There are, there are correctness issues related to it. Right. Yeah, it does, that, that's a very good point, right? If you do flush global, uh, and if you're operating on multiple blocks, then you need to ensure that somebody else does not catch the block after you did the flush global. Okay, a very simple 
cash coherence scheme, we'll get back to this. Basically, you can have caches observe each other's write and read operations. If a processor writes to block all other caches, invalidate that block uh, from their tag <coughs> point of view. So a simple protocol could be this, right? Each cache block has two states, uh, invalid and valid. Let's go through this so that uh, we're warmed up for other protocols. I'll kind of define the signals here. We have processor one. Actually, you can have any number of processors. Cache one and cache n. And we have two states. A block can be in either valid or invalid state in each cache. Uh, and there are actions. Each cache observes its own processor as well as a shared bus. Let's assume you have a shared bus across processors. And processor can do a read, and processor can do a write. And the cache can observe a bus read from another cache, if you will, and a bus write from another cache. Let's say initially uh, a block is invalid. Uh, a block is invalid in the cache, and this is a write through cache. That's the assumption here. Uh, you can you can figure out the write back cache on your own, if you will. Uh, and the processor does a processor read. This processor does a processor read. In that case, uh, what happens is uh, a bus read signal is sent to other processors on the bus, and the block becomes valid. Somehow you get the copy of the block. Does that make sense? So this processor does that processor read. It's not in the cache, which means that the block needs to be brought into the cache. And when the block is brought into the cache, a bus read signal is sent for that particular block, let's say bus read A. And all processors observe that bus read, if you will. And uh, for example, let's say one processor has the block, that block can be supplied from that processor's cache to this cache, in that case. Or it could be supplied from memory. Okay? And the block transitions to valid state. Uh, now this is the interesting part. Is here when a processor is in the val when a block is valid in the cache, and now let's say the processor wants to read it. If the processor wants to read it, now it can read the block without telling other processors because it's a valid state. This way, if you have multiple copies, let's say X is here and X is here, both processors can read it when the block is valid in their cache. Now what happens, one processor wants to write to it. The cache gets the processor write signal to block X. And what it does is, it sends out the bus write signal across the bus. And that bus write signal gets broadcast to all other caches. And the caches that see that bus write signal to block X they essentially snoop the bus, if you will. They look at the bus and check if they have log x in their cache, in the cache. And if log x is there, then the state of that block is transitioned to invalid. So this is what happens. If the cache has the block as valid, and if it observes a bus write signal, it turns the block into invalid. So valid bit has reset. In that case, it's a very simple protocol, right? Yes. Exactly. That's a very good point. So that's the we'll, we'll discuss the difference between an update versus a validate protocol. What I described to you is an invalidate protocol. When somebody else writes the value, other caches invalidate uh, the blocks. 
that is written to, the block that is written to. You could potentially broadcast the data value, and all other caches could update. And they, they are trade-offs related to that, which we will discuss soon. You may not want to do that because it's a lot of data also, because what if the other processors really don't need the data anymore, right? Yes? So it's, the assumption is that there is only one request that's being broadcast on the bus at any given time. Okay. You could handle multiple also, which means that you just need multiple ports. Right? Okay. So basically, when it, uh, the idea here is only one processor has, uh, has the block when it's writing to it. So you cannot have uh, the issue that we've seen before. Because when a, when a block is updated, it's only in one processor's cache. But if a block, and then after that, uh, another processor can request that block, right? The up-to-date block. If, a processor, uh, uh, if the block is an inbound state and a processor wants to read it, it sends a bus read signal, and the uh, cache with the most up-to-date copy Sends a, sing, sends a block back. Does that make sense? Yes. What if two writes happen to the same blocks in from by two different processes and they both have the same actions? Well then, well, there is a serialization point. Whoever acquires the bus first right. gets to write to that, and then the other processor gets to write. So that serialization is important, right? You're really serializing the writes to a location, and this bus enables that serialization. Two processors cannot write at the same time because to be able to write to a block, first they need to send a signal that invalidates all of the other copies of the block. Okay, so this is one example. We'll, we'll cover more protocols. And the, fact, the protocol you're going to implement is not going to be as simple as this because there are downsides to this protocol, right? As we will see. Okay, so, so there are some non solutions to cache coherence also. <laughs> I would say no hardware-based coherence. Keeping cache coherent is software's responsibility. This is really not a solution, if you will. It makes my fixed life easier, uh, but it makes average programmers' life much harder. Uh, now they need to worry about hardware caches to maintain program correctness, as if there wasn't enough things to worry about in programming. Right? And there's also overhead in ensuring coherence of software. This could work in domains where you don't need that much coherence. If, you're, if everything can, is parallel, the processors are not communicating, they're not updating, then this, this could be uh, doable. But as a general purpose solution, it's very tough to do. Well, the other solution could be all caches are shared between all processors, right? Yes? That's really funny, because I'm in an interview at Apple, and they asked me, like, how do you sell cache to So I was like, oh, it just only have one cache. Oh, this one? Yes, I did it. That's right, this solves the problem, right? Yeah. But again, the problem doesn't exist if you have this. If all caches are shared between processors, you don't have a coherence problem. Right? There's no need for coherence, except the problem is if you want to scale the system, this could work for maybe some number of caches, some number of processors. But now you have to, that shared cache becomes a bandwidth bottleneck. Right? And also you have to place that cache somewhere. But it's very really hard to design a scalable system with a low latency cache. Okay. So to maintain coherence, you need to guarantee that all processors see a consistent value or consistent updates for the same memory location. Uh, which means that writes to location A by processor 0 should be seen by processor 1 eventually. And all writes to A should appear in some order. So there are two key, key things that need to be provided for coherence. One is write propagation, if you will. You need to guarantee that updates will propagate to all processors at some point. And the second is write serialization. You need to provide a consistent global order for that particular memory location. Everybody see, needs to see the same order of updates. It means that there's, uh, there needs to be a global point of serialization for the store order for this update. And that's what existing processors are for. And we will see how that's done in different ways. 
Uh, so the basic idea, as I told you, a processor or cache broadcasts its write or update to a memory location to all other processors. And another cache that has the location either updates or invalidates its local copy. That's the most general form, if you will. Uh, so how can you safely update replicated data? These are two options that you question. Well, you question the invalidate protocol. Uh, that was the option we discussed. And sure, there's only one copy when you're updating it and updating it. The other option is, when you're updating a location, push that update to all of the other copies. Here, for example, when, when the processor actually wrote to X, it could send the new value of that cache block to everybody. And everybody can have that new value of that cache block. Yes? Yeah, for a write through cache, it's doable. But there, there could be reasons, still, right? And we will see those reasons. And you may not want to put the data if you're not going to use it. What's the point of having it here? You might as well have another cache block. If you invalidate it, you have more space for some other cache block. Maybe you could just make it at least recently used and also put the data in. So that way. You could do that, too. That's right. Now you're designing different protocols. <laughs> But if you're right back, then it's even a bigger burden, right? And we will see right back protocols. OK. So on a read, if local copy is invalid, the cache puts out requests, as we've seen. If another node has a copy, it returns it. Otherwise, memory returns a copy. On a write, we would like to read the block into the cache as before first. And then if you have, if you have an update protocol, uh, the, the cache writes to the block and simultaneously broadcasts the written data to the shares, if you will. And other nodes update their caches if data was actually present, if that block was actually present in their caches. If you have an invalidate protocol, the cache that has a copy writes to the block and some simultaneously broadcasts the invalidation of address to the shares. And other nodes clear the block from the cache. Do these shadows also include deeper levels, or just the two main Well, that's a good question. Yes, <laughs> we have. We will. We may discuss this later on, but it could include deeper levels. That's right. Because I mean, at some point it has to go to L2, so might as well start sending it. Uh, say it again. At some point, you would want to send. You would have to. Like, then not. You could put it directly in memory, I guess. But you would want to at some point put it in L2. Presumably. So you might as well start putting it as soon as you can. Oh, the, the, the up-to-date copy. Right. Yes. I mean, if, you, if you're doing update-based protocol, yes, you, you probably want to put it up into l as well. But again, that's a trade-off, right? But if you're going to do 10 updates, maybe you don't want to use your L2 band for that. OK, so which one do we want? And this is a trade-off again. It really depends on the right frequency and the sharing behavior. If you have an update-based protocol, and if the share set, if you will, the, the processor, the cache that share this block is constant, and updates are infrequent, this way you don't need to do the invalidation. right? Because invalidation has an overhead also. You first need to invalidate the block, and when another processor wants that block, they need to get it. So that's a separate overhead. Whereas if updates are not frequent, processor A can push the block to processor B, and the processor B doesn't need to request it again. That overhead goes away. So that's the advantage of an update protocol. Uh, there's a cost to invalidation and re-inquiring of the block, and you avoid that cost. The problem is, if this processor that wants to write to this block does 10,000 writes, let's say, without any interviewing read from another processor, now you've done 10,000 updates to all other processors for no reason. Right. Or 9,999 uh, 9, updates. Right. So that's the problem with an update protocol. Well, 
Well, it could be a plot bomb, but again, it could be also this block could have been used for some other purpose, right? Where, I mean, you could fix the problem by making it LRU, but still, you're keeping it valid. So it could, it's a power problem. It's also, it could potentially be a performance problem. Okay? And this is essentially a write-through policy, right? If you're doing updates, you're really writing through your cache. You're not keeping the data here, for sure, right? because you're updating some other cache. Which means that your bus becomes bottleneck if you're doing write-through. And if there are a lot of writes. If writes are extremely infrequent, this is not an issue. OK. In reality, protocol, on the other hand, uh, after broadcasting an invalidation, the core now has exclusive access rights. Okay. That's the only copy. The core knows that. And only those cores that keep reading after each write retain a copy. Right. So the, the caches are utilized better, perhaps. Right. Because as you replicate the data in the caches, you're reducing the effective utilization of your cache. If the cores are not reading the copy, and you're still pushing updates, this is exactly the same problem we discussed, you're really reducing the utilization of your cache, overall cache. The downside is, if write contention is high, this leads to ping-ponging. This is ping-ponging, I'm introducing a term here. This is essentially, what is ping-ponging? Ping-ponging is, uh, this processor writes to this cache, and this other processor also needs to write to that cache, or read from that block uh, later on. Uh, and then this processor later writes to that block. Now, there's a lot of invalidation that needs to happen. Right? This processor, let's say, uh, writes to block A, and then this processor reads from block A. When this write happens, it sends an invalidate request to all other caches. Blocks get invalidated. Now this processor reads block A. Now it gets the data, up-to-date data this pr from processor N, if you will. And let's say it writes the block A. Now it needs to invalidate that block, uh, that block from any other cache. Now let's say another processor comes in and it does a read. Read it. And let's say read it. Another processor does read it. Another processor does read it. Now they, have, they got the block, up-to-date block from this processor. Now let's say they keep doing writes. What happens is you get a lot of invalidation traffic. Whereas if you had an update protocol, in some situations like this, you didn't need to do that ping-ponging if you want. Whenever a processor writes the block, it pushes that data to another cache. Yes?
But you're, you're absolutely right. In cases where this processor, you know that this processor needs the data later on, update based processor, updates, uh, updating that processor makes sense. In fact, you could extend these, right? You could predict which processor will actually need the data and push that data to that, uh, push the written data to that processor. Yeah, you were going to say that? Yes. So, and people have proposed techniques like this, but in general, it's 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 relatively tough to do that. Yes. Does it make sense to talk about like protocol at a cache space, like core cache? Each cache has its own protocol. It's, it's like everyone can broadcast data, but can decide if it wants to take it or not. That's right. I mean, you could do that. You could have a predictor yeah. that predicts whether that cache block is going to be needed by this yeah. processor. That's right. Uh, as long as you can design a predictor, it could be feasible. <laughs> I don't know of any processors that do that. Okay. But these are interesting topics. Looks like you guys are <laughs> interested in them. Yes? Um, how much more expensive is a validation required than just updating? How much more expensive uh, is this, you mean? Yeah, yeah. If you have my right intention, how much more expensive is on validating than requiring? Oh, I see. So that really depends, right? That really depends on the latencies in your system. Uh, certainly, invalidating takes time because you need to ensure that all, if your system is large, for example, you need to ensure that all of the process, none of the processors have the uh, block before you write to it. So it, it does depend on the system. Like, if, if only a few of the processors actually have the block, like, do you actually broadcast and validate to every processor, or in the processor that actually just snip the bus for, for like the addresses that are invalidated? So the ones that don't actually have a block can just ignore it. I see. Yeah, because like, it seems like a require mm -hmm. and an update are like, they both involve transferring the actual block. That's right. Right? Exactly. So, so it should be like that dominates most of the time, and the validation is on. It's, so it almost feels like we get it for free. It's like, just having a block there is like an implicit saying this block is being invalidated. So, um, yeah, invalidation still uh, requires uh, checking the cache, though, right? The, the cache, you, even if you snoop the bus, you need to check the tag store to see if the block is there. But there, uh, there, there are solu solutions to it also. So, people have proposed a, a filter called bias filter, if you will. Actually, let's go back to Bloom filter, if you will. You can have a filter here. Instead of checking the tag store, you can check this bias filter. Basically, you get an address, right? You hash that address into a bit vector, and that bit vector tells you whether that address is in your cache or not. And you can have false positives. If there's a false positive, you go at actually invalidate or try to check your tag store in that case. Does that make sense? So invalidations can be made less expensive. Right. But, but they're still not free. You still need to either do this or uh, use, a uh, use a port in your tax store. Well, the thing is, like, just doing, just doing a bit of a require um, doesn't have any involve doing an invalidation. So you mean invalidation required? Yeah, like, every, everything you need to do for a require, like, you need to figure out, like, where the cache goes, whether That's you right. need to fix anything. Like that. So, like, doesn't have any. But, but that happens at different times, right? So you need to first invalidate, uh, maybe 5,000 cycles later, the cache wants to reacquire the block. So you, you cannot, maybe you can do it at the same time, but it's very unlikely. Okay. Okay. There, uh, now that we know update versus invalidate, these are the protocols, if you will. This could be applied to two major cache coherence methods that are present today. Uh, actually, I'll go over this very quickly because I will, I'd like to go into detail in both. Uh, what is Snoopy bus? Basically, what we talk about is Snoopy bus or Snoopy cache, if you will. Uh, you have a bus that's a single point of serialization for all requests. That's how every cache can see every other cache's requests. And this way, caches, I, I'm going to talk about caches and processors interchangeably, and slides are like that also in this case. I'm going to assume you have one cache per processor, but there are issues with multiple caches also, which we will not get into. 
uh, basically cache will observe other cache actions and infer what's happening, essentially. That's what happens uh, with a bus based protocol or a Snoopy protocol. For example, uh, I will introduce some terminology here. Read exclusive is a read request saying that I want this block and I want this to be an exclusive copy for my cache, which means that everybody else should invalidate it. If processor one makes that request for uh, block A on the bus, processor zero, and every other processor sees that request and invalidates its own copy. The second method, the directory-based protocol, is different. Uh, in this case, so in this case, if you look at this, you have a serialization point for all memory requests. Right? Every memory request, every block goes through this. Which means that this is a scalability bottleneck. Right? You need to have this bus. And how many of these processors can you add? Thousand? Well, <laughs> unfortunately, no. Then your bus becomes loaded, and your frequency goes down, and your bandwidth becomes a bottleneck. So directory-based protocols are more scalable. What they do is you have a single point of serialization per block, if you will. That's what you really care about. And this could be distributed among nodes. What a processor does is, when it needs to write or read, the write to a block or read from a block, it makes an explicit request to this point of serialization. It says, I want to read this block, or I want to write to this block. And that point of serialization, called directory, for that block, tracks ownership, if you will, for that block. For each block, you have some number of bits saying which processors in the system, which caches in the system actually have this block at this point in time. And we will see an example of this. And this directory, this serialization point, coordinates the invalidation. Let's take a look at well, an example, processor one, instead of broadcasting a read exclusive request on the bus, now sends a message to the directory saying, directory, I want an exclusive copy of this block. And do whatever it's needed to make sure that caches are coherent. And in this case, the directory gets this message. It asks all other processors. It knows which processors actually cache that block. It asks all other processors to invalidate their copies of the block. And waits for an acknowledgment. Once it gets all the acknowledgments from all the processors that had the copy of the block, saying that they have invalidated their copy, now it says, P1. Here is your copy. Do whatever you want with it. You're the only owner. You're the, uh, you're the cache that has, that has the only copy of that block. So that's the idea of directory-based cache coherence. It's very different, right? In this case, you have a bus. All actions are observed right away. Here it's more explicit. I want this block. So let someone else handle the invalidation rather than caches handling the invalidation in a distributed way, except there is a serialization point. OK. So the basic idea, you have a logically central directory that keeps track of where the copies of each block reside. And caches consult this directory to ensure, ensure coherence. So an example mechanism, I think we will, let's go through something like this. Mm. So for each block, in memory, directory contains p plus 1 bits, let's say, where p is the number of processors. And what do those bits mean? Let's, let's think of memory. If you will, let's memory is divided into blocks, cache blocks. We've done this many times in this course. Block 0, 1, 2, dot, dot, dot. And you have metadata associated with each block if you will. And how many do I have over there? Let's say we have four processors. Yes, P equals four. We have five bits. Two, three, four, five. Uh, so five bits per block. And each bit, well, this one bit is separate. Each bit, P of, each of the P bits specify whether that block is actually in that processor's cache. 
initially, let's say, the block is in no cache. And this bit specifies which block has the exclusive copy, if you will, if there's such a copy. Let's take a look at, let's go through this so that uh, we understand this. Let's say, uh, initially P1 takes a read miss to block A. So what happens is, uh, first time step, P1 sends a message to the directory, I want to read block A. Well, the, let's say this is block A now. The directory checks the bits for block A. Well, no one has the block. Which means that direct, uh, now P1 wants to have it. So the directory sends the block from memory to processor 1 and sets the bit of processor 1 to 1. Saying that processor 1 has a copy of the block. Yes? Why is that processor 1 bit? Oh, why is that processor 1 bit? Because this is processor 0 bit. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, good. I guess I didn't mark it down over there. Yeah, this is processor 0, 1, 2, 3. And this says, is it exclusive? Meaning, does the processor that has the only copy uh, has exclusive rights to modify that block? And we'll see why that makes sense soon. OK. So let's say here, next step, P3 takes a read miss, which means that P3 sends a message to the directory, I want to read A. So the directory sees the state. P1 has a copy. But P1 has a clean copy because it, does, it didn't request it to be exclusive. It's not right to the block. So the directory says, oh, P3, OK, you can have it. And sends the block to P3. Now two processors share the block. Well, let's see what happens afterwards. Well, P2 takes a write. So P2 says, I want to write to block A. This is also called a read exclusive request, if you will. Meaning that I want to read the block, and I want to have the only copy so that I can write to it. Now, when the directory receives this request, it sees that processor 2 doesn't have the block, and processor 1 and 3 have the block, and processor 2 wants to do a write. So what does the directory do? First send invalidate request to processor 1 and processor 3 that have the block. And wait for acknowledgement. Once the acknowledgements arrive, now the directory knows that no processor has the block in their uh, cache. Yes? So if you have any processors that uh, have the block in their cache at the event, uh, then you have to uh, wait for all the add times. Exactly. Because, uh, so remember, if uh, they could take different amounts of time because of contention, right? Maybe the processors are far away. Um. Latencies are different, right? That's why it's a more scalable protocol. The assumption is that this could scale to any number of nodes, any latency, if you will. You just wait for the acknowledgement. Maybe that arrives a million cycles later. OK, so now, uh, now uh, well, processor 2 wanted to write to A. So we're going to send the block to processor 2 from the directory. And the exclusive bit is also sent. So we know that now processor 2 can modify the block as it wishes. And it has the most up-to-date copy. It will have the most up-to-date copy. Okay. So that's what this says. Processor 2 can now update the block without notifying any other processor or the directory. But to be able to do this, processor 2 also needs to have a bit in its cache indicating that it can perform exclusive updates. And the, this is called the exclusive bit, or private bit for a cache block, if you want. OK, now let's, let's say this is the state. Now processor 3 wants to read the block. Oh, actually, it wants to write the block. Now it wants to write to it. What will happen? Well. Processor 3 sends the write request, or read exclusive request, if you will, 
to the directory. Now the directory sees that processor 2 has the block in an exclusive way, which means that processor 2 has the most up-to-date copy. So the directory sends a message to processor 2 saying, please send me the up-to-date copy and also invalidate your copy. Okay, because it has the up-to-date copy. Once it receives the data, as well as the acknowledgement, well, data can serve as the acknowledgement in this case, it sets processor 2's bit to 0, and this is not inclusive for now. Now it's got the most up-to-date copy. No one has the copy. Now it can send that block to processor 3, and processor 3 wants to write it right to the block, which means that these bits are set. Did I get it right over here? Looks like I did. Okay, and finally, processor 2 wants to read, let's say. Reading. In this case, again, a similar thing happens, right? It goes to the directory, I want to read A. Directory checks, processor 3 has the up to date copy. It requests processor 3 to send that block. And once processor 3 responds, well, it doesn't request processor 3 to invalidate that block, though, right? That's the difference between these two cases. Because processor 2 wants to read the block only. So processor 3 sends the block, but keeps it in, in its cache. And then uh, the directory sends the block to processor 2 and resets the exclusive bit, because now two processors are sharing the block. Right. So that's the idea. The directory is the controller, if you will. It controls all of the accesses going to the block. And it keeps an accurate, uh, accurately uh, keeps track of which processor has the block and which processor has the up to date copy. Yes? Using this way, can't one processor impact on another processor by taking away access? Well, if they need to be able to share data, right? They need to be able to share the same physical memory space, which means that these processors are actually up, are, are, uh, are actually running the threads from the same application. Right? This cannot happen across different applications. So you, somebody, somebody must have run the same uh, written that application. So that, that issue should not exist. Yes? Is it okay if like it's feasible to have a directory entry for blocks? That's a good question, yes. So okay. how do you actually make the scale? I told you that this is a scalable protocol. What if you want to add, I don't know, a billion proce processors? Right? Let's, let's say a thousand processors. You need a thousand bits here. Per memory block, how many blocks do you have in a, a 64 gigabyte memory system? 64 gigabyte divided by 64 bytes, is that 1 billion? That's a lot, right? So you want 1 billion times a 1,000 bits. Well, this is something to think about. <laughs> yes? It doesn't have to be, right? Actually, what I described to you it doesn't have uh, doesn't dictate anything about write through, write back. Uh, it could be write through, it could be write back, but it makes sense with write back, right? Uh, but what about like, when we went from number four to number five? Because yes. like now the data and the three um, is going to just be a non exclusive mode. So but it it, yeah. it it has to like somehow keep track of the fact that it's been modified, right? No, no, at that point. Uh, you mean T5 or which which one? Which action do you want uh, to go through? So, so you did a write in step four. Okay. So, so when did that write, when's that write going to actually go So let's say processor three wrote to block A. It made a read exclusive request. Right? Processor three takes a write miss. At this point, it can do anything to that block. It's a write back cache, let's say. 
because it has the, it has the only copy in the system, except for memory. Among all the caches, the only processor three has the block, and it can do any number of updates. Right? And directory knows that it has the most up-to-date copy, and every access goes through the directory for that cache block. Okay, but now we do the read in step five. Okay. So now what happens to the data that's okay. uh, spread in? P3 supplies it. Right. So what happens? Oh, okay. So P2 does a read. At that point, this is the state of the directory for that cache block. That read comes to the directory. The directory sees that the up-to-date copy is in P3. Ask P3, send the data, because someone else needs it. Don't invalidate your copy, but keep it as valid in that case. And now P3, uh, uh, the, uh, the directory has the data. You could write it to memory. You don't want to have multiple modified copies, right? You actually write to memory. Okay. But that's not write through versus write back, right? That's when do you actually write the data to memory? You can still have a write back cache. In fact, you do want to have a write back cache, I think. Well, if it were write through, then when it have already been written back to memory, uh, we need to do write through step four instead of when you do the uh, instead of when you do step five and you have to three. I I didn't understand that. So so if it so if it's a write back cache, right? Then you can delay the write to memory. That's right, exactly. Whereas if it's a write through cache, then you probably have the write happen back in step four. Exactly. So, so not, not back in step four, actually. There, there could be other steps I didn't show you. There are many other writes that are happening, right? Here. Because there could be steps here where processor 3 does writes to block A, and it doesn't need to notify anyone. Right? Because it has the exclusive copy. It knows that it has the exclusive copy. So this works very well with the write back cache. Okay. Any questions on directory based coherence? So the issue you raised is important. Like how, how scalable is this? So what happens in real systems is uh, you distribute the directory across the nodes. So there is no one central directory. Uh, let's say you have an address space. This is your uh, physical address, if you will. Uh, if you're, let's say this is your block offset, some of the blocks, uh, this, this is your uh, directory index, if you will. Where, where is the directory for these blocks? And using this, you determine which par partition of the directory that cache block actually resides in. So if you have n nodes, for example, uh, this is log 2 to the n bits, right? So you can have directly partition the n, place, n places in each node. And in real systems also, you cache the directory. So there are directory caches, if you will. It's just like caching the page table entries, right? Page table entry is metadata. This is another metadata related to, at least, uh, except it's at the cache block level. So frequently used directory entries are cached in processors uh, in the in the distributed portion of the directory. And this is also called the uh, basically all of the blocks uh, that have their directory entries in a node. Uh, so the node that hosts the directory entry for a block is called the home node for, for that block. And that home node can cache different directory entries so that you don't need to have the entire directory divided by n in there. Make sense? OK. So you can think about implementation issues. What are we doing on time? Oh, we still have some time. Okay, I guess we're not going to messy, but we should go. Uh, so Snoopy cache coherence, we've looked at this. All cache snoop, 
all other caches read write requests and keep the cache block coherent. And each cache block has coherent metadata associated with it in the tag store uh, of each cache. This is easy to implement if all caches share a common bus. You don't really need a common bus. It's easier to implement than a common bus. A lot easier, actually. Each cache basically broadcasts to read write operations on the bus. And this is good for small scale multiprocessors. Uh, because this bus is not scalable. Okay. Uh, I guess, I don't know if I can do this in five uh, minutes, but let's try to do it. Because <laughs> this, this is your assignment. Uh, hopefully you got the basic idea. So these are the processors. Each cache has coherent statements in the tag store for each cache block. For example, if your protocol is messy, you have two bits, modified, exclusive, shared, invalid. Uh, and I already told you this. Again, actions, processor actions to a block, each cache observes that, and bus actions to a block, each cache observes that. And we, we've seen the simple protocol. Let's look at a more sophisticated protocol. Uh, instead of having uh, a single valid bit, let's have two bits. Because remember the previous one, uh, well, let's say let's have two, two, two bits specifying three states. Modified, this is the cache line, that's the only copy, and it's dirty. Shared, cache line is one of several copies, and invalid, that cache line is not present. So when you get a read miss, uh, the processor makes a read request on the bus and saves the block and shared state. When there's a write miss, the processor makes a read exclusive request, just like we've seen. And that's broadcast. And the processor saves the block in modified state. And when the processor snoops read exclusive from another writer, it must invalidate its copy. Right? So when read exclusive is broadcast on the bus, if you will, uh, the processor uh, invalidates its own copy if it has it. Now, if a processor is in shared state, it can go into modified state without rereading data from memory. Right? Because it's, it already has the data, it just needs to send invalidate signals. Does that make sense? So this way you have three states. One says you have uh, a shared, you have, uh, there are several copies in the system in different caches, and modified is still the only copy. And you could go from modified uh, to shared as well, right? What do you think about how that's done? And this is a state diagram. We'll cover this, uh, hopefully, in the lecture in a little bit more detail. But I'll give you Nancy as well. So if you look at this, uh, MSI, you can go from invalid to shared to modified. This sequence takes two bus operations. What if data is not shared? This, this, uh, this leads to unnecessary broadcasts. So we're going to add an exclusive state, saying that this is the only copy, and it's clean in the system. The block is exclusive if, when you're doing a bus read, no other cache had it. And you can figure out how to do that. So now what you can do is, you can read the block in exclusive state, and you can write to it without notifying anyone. That's the silent transition. This is also called the Illinois Protocol, and I'll go over this in a little bit more detail in the next lecture. But this is the state diagram, uh, if you will. And you can walk through the state diagram. I'll put these slides up. Uh, this is another state diagram, and this is from actually uh, your, this is a simplified version of it in your course handout, and your course, uh, in your lab handout. The lab handout uh, describes exactly the state transitions. For example, uh, this is the exclusive state, right? If a cache block is invalid and this processor gets a cache miss, it gets the block in exclusive state. That's the nice part about the exclusive state. If you didn't have that exclusive state, exclusive state means that this is the only block in the system and 
it's, it's not modified, it's clean. You can call this exclusive clean, you can call this exclusive modified. <coughs> so now, uh, whereas shared means uh, there could potentially be multiple blocks in the system. There's at least one copy in the system. So you can think of this as shared clean, not, and this is exclusively, and this is exclusive modified. Uh, so when you get a cache miss, you get the cache uh, block in exclusive state. Because you somehow figure out that there is only one, that this is the only copy in the system. And you can figure that out by reading this. Basically, all of the snooping caches assert the signal if they have a copy. If one cache asserts that signal, you know that it's not exclusive. Right? So that's, that's the transition between uh, here versus here. If, 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 when the processor gets a cache miss, uh, if this is the only uh, processor that has that block, it goes into the exclusive state. Otherwise, it goes into the shared state. Now, what's the advantage of the exclusive state? You can write that block without notifying anyone else. So that saves uh, bus pen. Well, I'll leave you with this. This is Intel Pentium Pro's cache coherence diagram. It's essentially the MESI protocol. It's actually a very nice MESI protocol. It's perhaps cleaner than uh, what we had. Uh, and that's this is the transition that I showed you here. Email to exclusive clean transition. Pentium Pro was a bus-based multiprocessor. I think it supported four four processors, and actually more with multi chips. Uh, but this is hit means someone has the data clean. Hit M means someone has the data dirty. And if anyone has the data uh, when this pro uh, that when this cache is requesting it, this PR is processor request, processor read, then the block goes into the shared state. If no one has the data, then the block goes into the exclusive clean state. And if, if the processor wants to write to that block, when the block is in the exclusive clean state, then the block goes into the modified state. If the processor wants to read from that block, you stay at the exclusive clean state. And if, a process, if you see a bus read request in the exclusive state, then the block transitions into shared state, shared clean state. And you could also see a bus write request my exclusive uh, state, which means that somebody else is trying to write to that block, you better get rid of it. So you go into the invalid state. And there are other actions that are happening that I didn't show, but we will go over this in a little bit more detail in the next lecture. But I'd encourage you to get started. And all these protocols are very similar, if you will. Okay? I guess we can uh, meet next time. Sorry for keeping you.